Um, so my name's Ashok. You can also call me BT Mash if you like. Sometimes that's easier for these people to pronounce. And uh, tonight I'll be, uh, you know, I'll just go through an introduction regarding uh, who I am, who I'm representing, our requirements for launching the site. Uh, some of the site architecture and the modules we used, uh, some of the things that we created. There's one slide for migration from development to production, but uh, we can go into that more if we want afterwards. And um, just how things are going for us now, future plans, and if there's any time, uh, Q&A. So as I mentioned, uh, my name's Ashok, and I'm a systems programmer at the California Institute of the Arts. Uh, I've been working with Drupal since 2006, and I generally help with patches and upgrades for contributed modules on Drupal.org. And I'm rep I work for, like I mentioned, I work for the California Institute of the Arts. It's uh, one of the first art institutes in, uh, in the States, and uh, it comprises of six schools. Uh, it has a school of music, theater, and so on and so forth, and it's located in Valencia, which is 30 minutes north of L.A. And even though they generally have a happy history with Drupal, um, the previous site wasn't built quite the way I would have liked. Um, there were questionable choice in modules, um, and by that I mean there was odd theme integration along with poor use and um, availability of different content types. And just as a reference, this was our previous site, and you can see it do some funky effect. <laughs> but things just look kind of out of place on the site. The search didn't work particularly well. It was using the search from Drupal 5. There was very poor workflow on the site. And basically, whenever anyone in the Institute wanted to create a new piece of content, they would have to come to me or to another content editor, tell them, could you please create this page for us? We would create it for them, and then we'd be able to say, OK, now you have access to edit this page. So it was just kind of a long-winded process. And a number of schools got tired of the process and tired of the functionality that was being offered on the site and decided to create their own separate sites. However, the problem with all of this was, well, because they were creating their own sandbox sites, there was a lot of repeated or slightly different information. So we would have slightly different or maybe repeated student enrollment information. We might have repeated or kind of different information regarding the faculty and staff that work at our school or in some cases don't work out at our school. And really, we were just competing against ourselves for people to find relevant information on our sites. And for people that were interested in CalArts, they just wouldn't know where to look for the right piece of content. And that was a real big problem. So uh, this past year, we came at a crossroads on, well, Drupal 7 felt like at the time around the corner. <laughs> and uh, once Drupal 7 was out, Drupal 5 was no longer going to be supported. So uh, I pushed for us to upgrade the site, and they said yes. And I, uh, they went above and beyond, and to, uh, I got really lucky. They gave me the option to either upgrade the site or trash the one that we had. So I decided to trash the one we had. <laughs> and we, uh, we went with Drupal 6 because um, even though Drupal 7 was and is looking really good. Uh, Drupal 6, 6 was nonetheless extremely stable. And as it turns out, Drupal 7 is still in alpha. A very strong alpha, but still alpha. So regarding the team that went into, that was part of the redesign, uh, there were two designers with one uh, primary designer and one just as a consultant. Uh, two developers, which was myself and an intern. And uh, three primary content editors. And we organized ourselves using Basecamp because most of the people in the group had used Basecamp in some capacity in the past, and they were just very comfortable with it. And for a code repository, we decided to use Subversion. Now, I know a lot of people here use Git or Bazaar, but um, most of the team was just uh, quite comfortable with the set of tools that were available to use with Subversion. And we decided to go with Acquia Drupal as our externals library for providing updates. It's, it was just a matter of running SVN up, and Core Drupal was upgraded instantly. So now we come to our requirements. Well, we had talked with the schools about this exact problem, and we all decided that, okay, we'll stick with 
the various subdomains route that we've been going for these different schools to have their own sites. But at the same time, we need a way to unify all of the above under one system. So aside from providing a similar look and feel, um, each of the schools needed to have the ability to have their own color scheme, uh, typography, uh, control over what can go into predefined regions, and more, most importantly, they need to have control over their own content, which is what they had been fighting for in the first place. And a, as a bonus, it would have been nice for us to have the ability to publish content in one location, but to be able to say, okay, publish it to these different domains as well. So then we can have just one piece of, let's say if we had a piece of news and it concerned the whole institute, but it also concerned the School of Music, it would be nice to be able to publish in, in both of those places and not necessarily elsewhere on the site. Um, we also needed to make sure that certain types of content always pointed to a particular domain. So things such as our staff and faculty, they always needed, we needed to make sure that they're referenced at a particular location. No matter where else it may be published on the site, this is the one location that, that is the hub for where they can get the proper information. We also wanted better site-wide search and we wanted people to be able to create their own content. And it would be nice for us to be able to try and get the uh, top navigation that you see here to be a little bit smaller because it was a, a larger issue in the past wherein it, would, it was literally taking up half the page. So now we get into the design. Um, to try and unify the different sites that we had, we would try and use the top navigation as the glue piece to try to unify how they kind of look. So even if different sites looked different, there would be this top navigation area that would be similar across all of them and students or visitors to the site can can tell, okay, I'm on a CalArts site. And initially we were experimenting with one sub one primary theme and using multiple sub themes. Um, for each subdomain, but then we just decided to use one theme because it wasn't particularly working well with one of our modules, but it actually ended up working in our favor. And I'm just going to pull up the uh, initial design that we had for this, and basically this area that I'm highlighting with my mouse, that was going to be our navigation. Now it still looks quite big, but the idea was that after a certain period of time, or with the click of a button that would be here, that navigation would scroll up so then you can see the content that's behind it. And as I'm scrolling down through these pages, different schools could have slightly different looks and feels from the main site, and they could also have a different color altogether for their navigation. But the link placement would be the same. The way it scrolls up, the way it behaves would be exactly the same, so students can still, st still tell that they're on the same site. And this was just a mock-up that we had for the different schools. So you can see that they all look slightly different. They all do have different fonts, but there's something about them that says um, we're all part of the same team. So our theme, just to give a general idea of how it was set up, we were using the Zen theme, and we made a sub-theme out of that. So there was a header region, a first sidebar, second sidebar, there was a feature gallery area, which is where we would have larger uh, show pieces or call to links whenever we wanted people to go to certain areas of our site and content top, bottom, page closure, you know, the typical things. And to start off our site, we decided these are the content types that need to be a part of our site upon discussing it with the schools and all of that. So a lot of them expressed interest in basically having blogs powering their site, so we needed to, and the ability to have blog entries. And additionally, we were using WordPress to power one of the blogs for the Institute uh, as well, so we created a blog RSS feed to pull all of that information in. Uh, we have directory profiles, employment listings, events, front page links, and they're basically a sing they're links with an image to call on something important on our site. That's all they're for, or outside our site as well, in case it was something related, because CalArts works uh, with Disney and Pixar quite intimately, so sometimes we would call out to their sites as well. And we would also have galleries on our site, which consisted of audio, video, and photo items. 
There will be news items, program pages to call out various programs on our site, site pages, and web forms if uh, we needed particular forms to contact certain people. So, um, important modules that we use through the site. Um, you know, there are certain staple ones that people use on every site nowadays. Admin menu, CCK, image cache, path auto, token and views. They're, they're really common. The, the most important piece of the puzzle for this whole thing, for getting us, uh, getting us running, was the domain module. And I'm not sure if anyone else has used the domain module here, but basically it's a way to create a multi-site installation running under one database. Uh, that's the easiest way I guess I can describe it. And it came with a large chunk of the functionality right out of the box. So you could publish content to multiple domains. You could allow a specific domain to be a source of the piece of content. You could also allow for subdomain specific settings, so each site would be able to get its own look and feel theoretically. Um, it allowed us to create domain prefixes, so basically instead of having these different databases for each of the different sites, uh, we could have them share a large chunk of the tables, but at the same time we could have certain tables that are just dedicated to that one particular site. So as an example, um, each of the different sites are likely to have an about page. Now, if you have um, URL aliasing on your site, and if you're all running under that one aliases table that Drupal provides, it's not going to be possible. Because even though you're creating all these about pages, one of the sites might get the URL alias about, but the other ones are going to start getting about dash zero, about dash one, about dash two, and so on and so forth. So by using domain prefixing, we we're able to solve that issue. And, and that comes right out of the box with the domain module. And there was a contrib module called domain node type, which allowed us to say, okay, publish this type of content on this domain. It had its own issues, which we fixed, and I'll talk about that a bit as well. So let me get out of the old site and into, let's see, my site. So if I go into the domain section, let me just bring this in a bit and increase the font size. So as I increase the font size here, now you can see that, okay, I have this domain, primary domain called amodi.calarts.edu. But underneath it, and these are all referenced as part of the domain access module, I can define things like theater.amodi.calarts.edu or, or music and so on and so forth. And if I decided to try and create a piece of content, uh, such as a blog entry, I go through my typical pieces here, like the title, body, all of that. And as I get to the bottom, uh, let's see, you'll see something called domain access options. And it provides me with the ability to basically say, OK, publish it to aside from the main domain, because that's what I'm on, I could publish it to, let's say, the School of Critical Studies or Film Video. And then I can also say, make the source domain for this piece of content something like Aesthetics and Politics. And it, this, all of this functionality comes right out of the box with the domain access module. So it was critical in us solving this piece of the puzzle. Other modules that we used um, we used the hierarchical select module, and it basically provided a simple, a simpler way to define our menus and for users to make tree selections on our site. Now, this was another problem that we'd run into our site, uh, into the previous site with our content editors, in that it, they found it really difficult to try and figure out where they were in the menu, because our menus grew to 300, 400 odd items, and they're trying to figure out, okay, which tree am I supposed to be in? Well. If I go to my menu settings now, you'll see this thing called parent type. If I click on primary links, as I scroll down, you'll see that there are these different arrows right next to them. And if I click on, let's say if I click on help, it, it's, it traverses it, and then it gives me the option to basically drill down where I want it in there on the site. So now 
the photo policy would become the parent item for this new thing that I'm adding. And even though it's more clicks, it's much more uh, readable for a content editor, and it makes thing it really does make things faster. So we use that as part of our menus, and we use that to traverse through some of the different taxonomies that we have on our site as well. Uh, hierarchical select. Uh, we also use the feeds module, and this was to import content from our site blog and various other, um, uh, a couple of other sites into our primary, into our uh, site as well. And we also use the WYSIWYG module uh, because a lot of people felt comfortable with using this um, generally. Um, one other thing that we had run into on the previous site is whenever people would try and post links to other documents that were on our site, they would go to that page, copy that particular link, and then paste it on to the page. Now the issue with that is this is an already alias version of that piece of content. So if I go and edit that uh, particular item down the line and the alias changes, suddenly it's broken. Or if I delete it or whatever it, or you know, if I do something else with it, or if I'm migrating it into a dev uh, site, because it's hard-coded, it makes things really difficult to uh, work with. So I use this module called Pathologic to ensure links would work even after the migration. And basically what it did is it provided a... Uh, it was a filter for putting a node ID onto the page as a link. So even if the alias changed or if I changed sites from dev into production, the link would stay, uh, would be proper. So it would be dev.calarts.edu slash about. Or if I if it moved into production, then calarts.edu slash about. And I used it with this module called Linkit, which is a WYSIWYG plugin. And it just, uh, people can start typing out the title of a particular piece of content, and it'll start providing references for it. Sweet. So let's say if I go back to creating my blog entry, and let's see. Oops. So it provides a new uh, button, and it says link it for it as well. So it opens up you know, whatever it is, and then I can start typing in about, and then you can see it starts listing out some of the content that I would have the word about in there. And I see, okay, I want it to be about CalArts. So then it provides the path in there, I can click insert, and it puts it in. And so then that way, whatever I change the site to down the line, it'll work. It's been, it's been an extremely helpful module. <laughs> we also use panels on our site. And this was primarily used for subdomain home pages wherever uh, we had pages where they had an introductory piece of content followed by a blog or if they wanted to have blog with certain events listed out on the page as well. And we also used it as a variant for our user home pages. So then they could see links on creating new content ed or editing some of their own existing content. So. So if I went to my user page, there would be a variant that shows uh, what type of content, some of the types of more common content that can be created on the site, and some of the things that I'd created or um, things that I probably need to edit on the site as well. So it was just a way to be able to manage whatever content was coming in by me or others onto the site. And um, another very important module that we used was features. And this was critical for us because uh, it basically, any types of views or content types or image cache presets or feeds or even panels. Your attention, please. The library will be closing in 30 minutes. The floor restaurant will be closing in 15 minutes. In your library part, you go to customer service desk immediately. Again, the library will be closing in 30 minutes. The second floor restaurant will be closing in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. You hear that about the bathroom? If you gotta go, it's still just, for, just wait until first floor. Right? Don't go up here. <laughs> well, basically, uh, all the stuff that we created, we could export out into a module. So instead of having all of these uh, 
pieces living in the database, since they're now exported into a module or a series of modules in our case, we could put it in our code repository. We could see exactly what kind of differences were, uh, what kind of changes we've made. And it provided a more consistent way to make sure we, to go from our development environment into our live environment. So, and it also allowed us to disable uh, the views UI and image cache UI, as an example, on our live site, because in this way, no one can change it there. And eventually, we're hoping to use it for storing taxonomy and permissions and all of that as well. But right now, it, it's one of the more critical things that we have uh, for our day-to-day -day operation. We also use the uh, Lucene API, uh, and that's for uh, better search, basically. Now, I ideally wanted to use Solar, but because we use FreeBSD on campus, and FreeBSD and Java don't don't necessarily gel all too well together. Lucene API turned out to be a pretty good alternative. It's still quite fast, and given that we have about 2,000 pieces of content on our site, it's just fine. It integrates well with the domain access module, and it also generates pretty decent results. Um, running something like this on our previous site really wouldn't give my profile as the first listing before. <laughs> And now it does. And since we have faceted search on our site as well, people can drill down to, uh, to a more specific piece of content. So very useful, highly recommended. We use Shadowbox as, uh, for doing some of our lightboxy effects. And we use external links, the external links module. And this was also, to me, it was important because it let users know that they're leaving the current domain that they're on and they can expect a slightly different look and feel on the site. It was just psychologically, I guess for me, it felt like, okay, I'm preparing myself for something like that. And we also use views to attach for our galleries. Because as I'd mentioned, we can have a gallery content type, and then each of those can be, at, uh, anytime you create an audio, video, or photo item, they can then reference that particular gallery. And then we use the views attached to be able to populate them out. And we also use stuff like Parallel, and that was just for uh, having a separate domain to serve our images and JS and CSS files. We use Swift tools for our audio formatters. And even though it's not a theme, we use Rubik and Drush on our site. Rubik is fantastic for, uh, uh, for admin work, and Drush is fantastic, period. So we solved a whole bunch of different things, but even though we got all this functionality out from the contributed modules, there were pieces that were unsolved. And just as, an ex as some of the things that I've listed here, whenever we, were, whenever we imported feeds into our site, they wouldn't get tagged into a particular domain. So as an example, we were pulling in the feed from the School of Theater blog. However, it was getting published on all of our domains, and we didn't want that. And even though we were using the domain no type module, it still provided people with the ability to change what domains a, a particular piece of content belongs to, it, with even explicitly removing the original one that it, sh it should have belonged to. And a as I mentioned here, sites couldn't have their own aliases. We fixed that with the domain prefix module. And we use domain prefixes for caching as well, but that has its own issue, uh, which we solved. So. To solve the uh, issue in Contrib, uh, at least for the uh, making sure that content goes to a particular domain, I created a helper module for the domain node type thing called domain node type defaults. And that basically ensures that certain content type are always published to a particular domain. The certain content type are always sourced at that particular domain, so it cannot be changed at all. And if the person is not on that particular domain when creating that piece of content, they'll get redirected there as well. And this was just to ensure that it would play with the aliases uh, table and any other, any other prefixing that might need to occur for that piece of content for that domain. So just to give an example, as I would mentioned, we use it for, uh, for our faculty. And right now, as you can see, I'm on amodi.calarts.edu. So if I go to try and create a directory profile, I will get jumped over to directory.amod.calarts.edu. And 
then I fill out all of the stuff that's there. And if I go to the domain access options, you can see that the faculty staff directory is populated and it says default domain to the side of it as well. And you know, let's say I want to click here and I decide, nah, it doesn't really belong in the directory even though I'm creating a profile. It comes with, with a message that says it must remain checked as it is a default domain. And so if I press enter, it'll check it back again. And for the source domain, you can see it's no longer a select list. And it explicitly just says that this is a pre-selected domain. So it'll always get published to that domain, no matter what. And to solve the other issue that I would mentioned regarding the feeds, I made a more general module called Domain Specific Settings. And this became our general CalArts module. And in this scenario, it runs on the cron task. It checks the feed items that were retrieved and sets the source domain to the same thing as that feed, as the feed source. So, um, and then, like I mentioned below it, any other pieces of content that we needed to add to make the site function the way we needed, we would start populating it into this module. That was the idea. And so now the things from Contrib are solved, but there are pieces that the contributed uh, part of Drupal.org didn't solve. And we needed to create, still create a somewhat flexible uh, navigation that could open or close, or a monster menu, that's the other word for it. We still need a customizability in typography. Um, we were initially heading down the path of using Cipher, but I personally was not comfortable with using Flash for displaying text. I, I don't think Flash should be used for something that simple. And um, we also needed to figure out a way to do flexible color schemes and um, having different backgrounds for different domains. Because even though there is a module called background on Drupal.org, it only works within the scope of a single domain. So if you try to change your uh, background image on one site, it'll actually change it on all the others. And that didn't work for us. And uh, we also needed a carousel that fit our our own needs because the views carousel module that was available it's great it's a fantastic module but it just didn't fit our use case so we made a bunch of custom modules uh, the first one we called views carousel and by purpose I called it that and it's not in contribute due to the namespace issue we might change it in the future but as I mentioned it it probably won't be very useful to others in the community the good thing about it is it's a views plugin, so you just pop it into we just popped it into our site. It's very lightweight. It's I was talking with someone else and it's maybe thirty lines of PHP code and thirty lines of JavaScript code. It's extremely fast as well. So if I go back to our site, it's powering not only the main uh, thing that we have here. But if we go to the different schools, it's also powering their carousels uh, with it. And the good thing about it is as we make it wider or however it may be, it just it, it's quite flexible in how it works. But that's all. We also created a domain background module, which is also not in Contrib. We're, we're still trying to evaluate how useful it'll be. And it was useful for uploading a background image or selecting a background color. It allows you to uh, center, tile, or position that particular image. And since we were using the domain access module, it naturally was also friendly to site set up using the domain access and multi-site setting stuff. And as another small module, we created something called Calor's Twitter poll. And it was just to uh, pull in Twitter statuses for the different accounts that we had. And we went with this route because the Twitter module is quite heavy. It, it does create its own database tables and some of the calls it makes are, they get kind of heavy. So we just went with something that I think it came out to 10 lines of code in the end. And um, since there are already a number of modules on Drupal.org dealing with Twitter, we, we didn't decide to submit this. We did, however, submit two modules back to Drupal.org. And the first one is the Google Web Font Loader API and the other was FlexiColor. Now, I've talked about both of these modules in the past, in a, at past uh, LA Drupal meetups, but basically the Web Font Loader API uh, gave us a flexible way to, to provide our own fonts on the site. 
and to get and so this way the different sites that we have could have different fonts as you can see here here and here and changing a font ultimately was as easy as going to a settings which was called Google Web Font Loader Settings and changing the font there and it also had the ability to cache the uh, Google JavaScript library on your own site so if something happened with uh, if the Google uh, APIs went down for some reason which it won't but if it did it would be on your site and it would still be running and again this was also domain access friendly and the other was FlexiColor and basically it amounts to a series of selectors for which uh, colors can then be chosen and you can based on these different selectors that you have you can also create different presets on your site and the idea with this was that um, basically if there was another if there was a site editor and they decided they wanted to change some of the look on their site they would have these uh, these areas that they could change these settings for so my directory it has a very basic color scheme at the moment but as an example I could choose something like uh, let's see school of art and suddenly you can see these sections here have a different color as well so that, or I can choose entirely different colors an entirely different color scheme altogether and it'll get reflected on the overall site so now if I went back to my faculty staff directory it looks slightly different. I'm not doing this on the live site <laughs> for obvious reasons <laughs> but as you can see it does change the look and feel of the site by a little bit and as I mentioned they're both on Drupal.org now and now as we now at this point you know we have the site working the way we want it's all running peachy on our dev site and it's time to migrate out and put it onto our live site. So, just a piece of advice: always make notes if there are too many steps involved. Yeah. And I say one step is too many steps. <laughs> so, the main idea is, you know, since we were using Basecamp, just let everyone know what's involved in making this thing, making all these changes. It also let me know, okay, I need to follow all these steps as I'm migrating out, and with a conventional uh, site migration you don't uh, you don't because I was using the domain access module we ran into the issue that uh, because we're defining the different domains um, on in the domain access UI they would be defined as amod.calars.edu or dev.calars.edu so I needed to rename them uh, manually so I would do a database dump and then do you know we, whenever you see dev.calars.edu rename it to CalArts.edu. Yeah, exactly. And um, what else? And the other thing that you should do and try and do as often as you can is just perform a test migration. So try to do it from dev into staging. And what this lets you do is it lets you is uh, time it out. So if someone asks you how long do you think uh, this whole thing is going to take, you can give, you know, whatever time it took you multiply it by two three whatever you want and then say okay it's gonna take me four hours and you know then the day of if it takes four hours okay that's that was expected if it takes two hours great and um, as I mentioned it was slightly different from a typical site migration um, even though I'd done the search and replace and all of the content came through correctly certain variables and view settings didn't and basically what happened is because PHP serializes all of these different settings that are there in the settings table if you try and rename them if they're not the exact same length PHP thinks oh it's uh, it's a bad setting or it's a bad serialization and it basically says make it empty so whatever changes we would made to some of our views and to some of our variable settings they were suddenly coming in empty so Taking these uh, by making these notes, I was able to say, okay, these variables I know I need to change, I need to rework on them anyways. And for the views, since they were stored in features, I was literally able to just uh, go to the features area. Uh, let's see.
this is what a features uh, uh, management area would look like. And you can see some parts that might say overridden. And in the case of our life site, that's what it shows, that it was overridden. So then if I went to its state, I could then click on any of the settings that were affected by it and just hit revert components. And literally five seconds later, the site's working as it was before. So that's that was part of our migration strategy. And for some of the issues that are not found in regular sites, most mods, there are certain modules out there that use variable set and variable delete directly on form submission. And this isn't compatible with the domain access module and the way it works in setting up settings for uh, multiple sites. So, I mean, you need to rework your own modules on how you want it to function. But our modules are much better for it. It helped us understand, A, how Drupal works, and B, how some people are programming, and how we were programming. And we were able to make modules that are more flexible. Please, why are we closing in 15 minutes? Second floor restaurants are not closed again. The library will be closing in 15 minutes. I'm almost done. <laughs> also, if you were using the domain prefix module, and you were deciding to have, uh, you, you were deciding for each of your sites to have their own caching tables, you have to define it to your Drupal installation that you are that you have all these other tables that need to be cleared when you're clearing the Drupal cache or all of your caches. And the way we found out this issue is when we cleared the cache from one site, um, we were finding that, okay, that one site looked fine, but as soon as we went to another site, it suddenly looked like the styles were gone and the JavaScript was gone. And that was because we were using aggregated CSS and JavaScript. And so even though the caching for that one particular domain has been cleared, because you're sharing your JavaScript and uh, CSS all in one directory, if, if it's aggregated, it's going to clear for all your sites. So we wrote this aspect into our domain-specific module, and we wrote it in a way that's flexible. So if we add more domains or if we add other caching tables to be prefixed, it'll pick up on those right away and uh, let Drupal know that these are also other tables that need to be cleared with it. And we're considering either adding this to the issues Q4 domain module or adding it as its own separate contrib module at this point. But it will be addressed out there somewhere. And we launched this on September 1st. We're approaching the end of the month. And we still have a large menu, but it does get hidden now. So we can open it and close it. So at least it gives a bit more room for the content on the site. The, the different schools that are at CalArts feel much more confident about the website. So various programs in, in the different schools are interested in being a part of what was created, and they're getting their own sites now. And we started this with some of the MFA programs in critical thinking, and now we're moving on into character animation and, or, and some of the programs in our theater department. And we're also getting feature requests from content editors on what, what they would like the site to do. In the past, they would be pretty quiet about it. And you know, as I'd mentioned before, they would just go ahead and create their own site. Now they feel like, OK, these guys know what, how to do stuff, so we'll just ask them for it. And the best part is content editors can create their own pages. <laughs> so in our future, there are a bunch of different things that we want. Personally, I want to try and do performance optimizations, such as Memcache, Solar, and Pressflow. And I think it's time for me to stop now. But we can talk about this uh, either at Drupal After Dark or you know, uh, outside this presentation. So uh, thank you. So we're obviously, unfortunately, not really going to have to.